Welcome to Horizons of Thought. Today, I will discuss New Zealand's new vaccine pass. Buckle up, folks. This is a long one. So I posted links and timings to each section of this talk. First, I will loosely summarize the science behind the COVID-19 messenger RNA vaccines, including details on vaccination of adults, 12 to 17 year olds, and five to 12 year olds. This discussion will include vaccination versus natural immunity for COVID-19, the effects of vaccines on infection rates and viral load, which is a leading indicator of COVID-19 spread. I will compare these effects to age and body mass index and what we know of the new Omicron variant. I will then discuss the actual vaccine pass system used in New Zealand, comparing our vaccine pass and other nations' immunity passes. I will end with a discussion of how governments and the media can, by malice or incompetence, generate fear, hate, and division in a society. This discussion will detail the moral damage that has begun in New Zealand and provide my viewers with tools to resist this harm and prevent devastation and ruin. Lastly, I will discuss the specific response I believe fellow Christians should have to New Zealand's vaccine pass. This last section will leave science and politics behind and focus on theological arguments, so it will appear after the end credits. Let's begin. COVID-19, as everyone knows by now, is a new coronavirus that showed up first in Wuhan, China in late 2019 and quickly spread around the world. The disease spreads through infected drops of saliva that can either land on nearby surfaces or remain airborne for extended lengths of time. COVID-19 viruses look like a ball with a bunch of funky shaped spikes on it. Those spikes are made of proteins and are used to drill into human cells, mostly epithelial cells. Then the COVID-19 virus moves its RNA into the cell, where the cell sets up a factory and starts pumping out more COVID-19 viruses. The shape of these spike proteins matters a lot. That's because most of the vaccines made for COVID-19 don't rely on dead or weakened versions of the virus to work. Instead, they rely on the use of messenger RNA strands that dendritic cells near the vaccine injection site carry away, read, use to produce spike proteins, and then destroy. The body therefore makes spike proteins very similar to the ones in a COVID-19 virus. The proteins are eventually captured, taken to lymph nodes, and showed to lymphocytes, T and B cells. The T cells teach the B cells how to make antibodies, which are proteins with holes in them, shaped like the locks that fit the spike protein keys. These proteins can swarm around COVID-19 viruses and disable them. The T cells themselves stay on the lookout for spike proteins and summon the antibody army when needed. In this way, mRNA COVID-19 vaccines teach the body how to detect and hunt down COVID-19. The vaccine cannot give you COVID-19 as it has no COVID-19 within. The vaccine cannot change your DNA because that's simply not how mRNA works. mRNA exists precisely because animals need a mechanism to produce proteins that does not mess with DNA. The process is safe for the vast majority of people. However, sometimes it goes wrong because the spike proteins themselves can cause harm to the body even when there is no COVID-19 virus. They are, after all, a drill designed to attach to cells and let large molecules pass through. So they can mess with cells and even the blood-brain barrier. Also, very rarely, the immune response can be harmful as the immune system is complex. Normally, that would be the end of the story. The vaccine simply saves many more lives than it risks. However, COVID-19 has quite a unique property amongst the world's communicable diseases. Children don't get COVID-19 easily, and they don't get it nearly as badly as adults. In one paper, Lingzi and colleagues have, in their supplementary figure two, 
shown a dramatic difference in PCR CT values based on age of acquisition of COVID-19. Let me translate that into English. When you go to the doctors to get a giant Q-tip from hell rammed up your nose, that nasal violation is to collect boogers, kind of like Venkman did for Egon and Ghostbusters. In those boogers, there might be some COVID-19. So the lab runs a polymerase chain reaction test to multiply the RNA in COVID-19 until it can be detected. This process of replication is cyclical and the point at which COVID-19 is detected is a cycle threshold. It is important to know that each cycle multiplies a potential RNA sample by about two. So if your PCR test detects COVID-19 at a low CT value, say 18, the test only needs to multiply your viral load by 250,000 times for your disease to be detected. If your PCR test detects COVID-19 at a high CT value, say 34, the test needs to multiply your viral load by 17 trillion times for your disease to be detected. As we age, if we get infected with COVID-19, we carry orders of magnitude more viral load than children. So the data strongly supports the argument that children pose a much lower risk of spreading COVID-19 than adults. There is only one caveat. Little children touch everything. And so on the rare occasions when they have a high viral load, they tend to give COVID-19 to the whole family. See figure four. This trend towards adults being more contagious than children is especially true of so-called super spreaders. With these people, the most significant predictor of viral load is age multiplied by body mass index. Children also have a much lower risk of death than adults. In the UK, as of July 2021, there were 6,338 hospitalizations, 259 pediatric ICU, and 25 deaths of children under 19. That's 25 deaths out of the UK's total of 128,000 deaths. So when you assess a tiny vaccine risk that is stable across all ages against a disease risk that is incredibly tiny among children compared to adults, you need to be very careful about your assessment for which age group should be vaccinated. To explain, when the FDA met to decide whether to fully approve the Pfizer vaccine for 12 to 17 year olds, they had some good arguments for doing so, but also a solid argument against doing so in their scenario number three, based on low US caseload for June of 2021. In this scenario, the vaccine harms more children than it helps. Now, with higher caseloads, that negative assessment from their third scenario isn't necessarily currently accurate. And the justification for approving the vaccine for 12 to 17 year olds seems more solid. However, they still approve the vaccine for children this age based on at most a 10 to 1 benefit and possibly much less. Historically, vaccine approvals required a 100 to 1 benefit. I can't prove that because I can't find any citations for my claim as all the search tools are overwhelmed by the current practice. But I was certainly taught this from many sources when I was younger. Public health officials had such strict rules for approving widespread direct medical interventions for two reasons. The first is they sometimes have the authority to force interventions like vaccination on children without parental consent. Doing so is a divisive act that should only be reserved for obviously justified cases. The second is that approvals for vaccination last a lot longer than the conditions under which they were made. For instance, the CDC argues that the Delta variant of COVID-19 is 10 times more dangerous to children than the earlier variants. So if the US currently had any of the alpha, beta, or gamma variants of COVID-19, the approval could have only been justified by arguing that children might spread COVID-19 to their parents and grandparents. Because with these variants, the vaccine causes more harm to children than COVID-19 does. So, given what we already know about children and COVID-19 virus loads, a current 10 to 1 benefit is a weak argument at best. 
And that leads me to the newest COVID-19 variant, Omicron. We know that the Omicron variant has many mutations that affect the shape of the spike proteins, which means that vaccination and previous immunity have a limited effect in preventing infection with this variant. However, reports from South Africa and Japan also show that the Omicron variant seems to produce mild symptoms. If so, this is the usual and expected evolution of a disease, that it spreads more rapidly with mutations and that it becomes less dangerous with those same mutations. With these reports from experts from multiple countries, the decrease in symptoms and the reduction in vaccine effectiveness means the decision to approve the Pfizer vaccine for people under 18 years of age is likely already out of date. This example illustrates quite clearly why we had 101 benefit to risk rules for use of direct large scale medical interventions in the first place. And I am hardly alone in my views. In the UK, in September, the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunization said no to vaccinating 12 to 15 year olds, the, long, the younger half of this set. It appears they changed their mind later on, allowing parents or children themselves to choose if they want to be vaccinated at this age, but not be forced to do so. Given the edge case of 12 to 17 year olds, the new push to vaccinate five to 12 year olds with the Pfizer vaccine appears to be unwarranted at this time. And I am quite aware that some countries have not only allowed, but mandated vaccination of children five to 12 years old, including my home province of Nova Scotia, Canada. Now, having given you arguments in favor of Pfizer vaccine approval in adults and against the same vaccine in children, let's discuss natural versus vaccinated immunity. At least with the mRNA vaccines, two things are very different. The mRNA vaccines provide a response to the spike protein and guarantee a minimum amount of that spike protein in the body based on vaccine dose. However, natural immunity will be based on all the proteins that your immune system responds to and not just the spike protein. That's why the mRNA vaccines can boost immunity over and above natural immunity, but also why natural immunity can be upwards of 13 times more effective than mRNA vaccine immunity. Keep this epidemiological information in mind as I now move on to the vaccine pass system implemented in New Zealand as compared to the rest of the world. In Europe, as nations moved away from lockdowns into trying to return to some form of normalcy, they created what the rest of the world called a vaccine passport system, especially for large scale events. These were not actually purely vaccine passports, but a choice between a recent COVID test, either PCR or rapid acting, depending on the jurisdiction, evidence of COVID antibodies, or a full course of vaccination based on the accepted recommendation for the vaccine used. These systems were based on immunity rather than vaccination, allowing people freedom of action while still allowing governments to try to flatten the curve. But here in New Zealand, when we implemented our traffic light vaccine pass, we did not allow for COVID antibodies or recent COVID testing as an alternative. There have also been many places that implemented a no jab, no job policy. It started with the managed quarantine system where very high exposure to COVID compared to the rest of the country made such a rule reasonable. Working at MIQ was hard. Workers also got tested once every three days if they were facing quarantined people. As a result, only those most dedicated to stopping COVID from entering the country, including members of the all voluntary New Zealand military had such jobs. At the time, I never objected to such a rule and still do not. I once served in the Canadian military and I figured that while in the military service, my job was to implement, not make policy. I tend to think it is good 
for the people who carry the big guns to defer to their civilian governments as long as those civilian governments don't order us to break the law. However, from November 15th to January the 1st, New Zealand is implementing a rule that prevents anyone who works in healthcare and anyone who works with children from keeping their jobs if they are not vaccinated. We lost about 700 teachers and upwards of 3,000 of our medical workers due to these rules. An argument can be made for sacking the medical workers, though it is weaker than you might think, as many are tested as often as MIQ workers. But as I noted above, and based on the data I can find, it is harder to make an argument for sacking people who interact with children. After all, the risk is much lower than interacting with adults, and especially the elderly. And there have even been plenty of other people who have lost their jobs, who were neither teachers nor medical professionals. If I am to believe the self-report submitted to Don't Divide Us New Zealand, this includes people who exclusively work outdoors. Which is interesting because there have been literally zero reports of any strain of COVID spreading outdoors from anyone who is separated from others by two meters. I could find none anywhere in the world. Yet I have certainly heard a lot of people make strong arguments in support of New Zealand's strict vaccine mandate. I've overheard and been trapped in conversations full of people who wanted all vaccinated people fired from jobs in New Zealand or fired and thrown off benefits, or forced into vaccination through the most invasive forms of COVID testing applied cruelly. There are a lot of angry people out there who hate the unvaccinated and wish to destroy their lives and livelihoods unless they comply with demands to be vaccinated. Many of these arguments are centered around the fear that unvaccinated people will make vaccinated people catch COVID. I have heard some pretty extreme argumentation up to and including calling the unvaccinated terrorists. Arguments complete with graphic detail and horrific imagery. But are such arguments justified based on the COVID research data? Let's begin with the positive evidence. Unvaccinated people are more likely to catch COVID-19 and have more serious cases if they do. One study of people in Los Angeles said that recently vaccinated people are hospitalized at a rate of as little as 1 29th that of unvaccinated people. This extreme result was only true during spikes of infection rates, such as the recent one that began in July of 2021 in Los Angeles. Yet this effect can mean a lot when hospitals get overwhelmed during a spike in infections. And it is outcomes like this that I consider the best argument for adults to choose to vaccinate themselves against COVID-19. A large scale study also suggested unvaccinated people tend to live together and spread COVID to each other about twice as easily as do vaccinated people. However, the same paper showed unvaccinated people do not infect vaccinated people any more easily than vaccinated people infect each other. In addition, the best evidence I have found suggests virus loads are the same amongst infected vaccinated and unvaccinated people. Compare that to the viral loads based on age and BMI I discussed above, both of which had a strong orders of magnitude effect on viral load. Now, I would hope you would react with horror towards discriminating against people based on age and BMI. Yet, as I said, I regularly encounter people who want to discriminate against unvaccinated people based on what is clearly much flimsier evidence. So why is this so? Well, I'm quite sure I know where the fear comes from at least in New Zealand, and it has more to do with social rather than epidemiological reality. In the beginning, New Zealand got very lucky. We are a small pair of islands in the middle of no and where, and so we have time to contemplate lockdowns before we implemented them. So when the New Zealand government finally locked down the population, 
the relatively early and hard response worked very well. To keep COVID out, we implemented a managed quarantine system. It preserved the country from COVID for several months, and nearly every leak affected Auckland and surrounding areas alone. So far, so good. Except that the biggest reason we had to lock down so hard is that New Zealand's medical system was stretched past the breaking point before COVID. People actually died of the flu, improperly cared for due to ICU overload every flu season in New Zealand. We had no capacity to handle any new disease, no matter how mild it might be. In the past two years, the New Zealand government did little to increase medical staff. They did replace some old facilities with newer ones in places like Christchurch, but we can't use the full floor space of the new facilities because we do not have the staff to operate the extra beds. This problem was so serious that many senior medical people in Christchurch straight up resigned last year. That massive red flag was apparently ignored. We now have some extra capacity due to reduced influenza in New Zealand, but it isn't much because remember, we were already short of medical capacity to begin with. I myself had to go to an emergency room recently and the place was overwhelmed on a Tuesday night such that I could not get care until the sun started to rise. And Tuesday is not exactly the busiest night of the week. Then in 2020, and especially in 2021, we had a few cases of COVID leak into Auckland, causing them to experience more lockdowns than the rest of the country. So people in Auckland and surrounding areas are much more stressed out than we are in Christchurch. So much so that my home value has gone up insanely. People are prepared to spend big money to escape Auckland and move to Christchurch. The next issue is that we took an extra six months to start national level vaccination as compared to the rest of the first world. This delay occurred because the Labour government negotiated acquisition of the Pfizer vaccine quite late. The delay was made longer due to an underlying difference in the cultures that make up New Zealand. The Maori people, who represent one of the two founding nations of New Zealand, have a higher distrust of government and vaccination in general than other populations. The New Zealand government also did not work well with Maori populations in implementing their vaccination policies. This is well documented. They have therefore vaccinated at a lower rate than the rest of us. So when Delta got into the country in the winter of 2021, we didn't have enough vaccinated people to respond with anything but yet another lockdown. We all went on lockdown for a second time and I lost count of the times for Auckland. Their most recent lockdown lasted more than 107 days. During this time, we continuously heard news that it would only get better if we vaccinated more people faster. Auckland in particular was put in some of the strictest lockdowns in the world for months and straight up told that unvaccinated people were to blame. By the media, by our government, and every day. Imagine how they feel. Now add in a traffic light system where every place is orange or red, even places that have had no COVID-19 in almost two years. Such a thing really sets the tone for fear. Now add in a vaccine pass system that doesn't allow for prior infection or testing. A vaccine pass system that all adults and children 12 years and three months and older must show to enter any place of hospitality. A vaccine pass that all adults and children 12 years and three months or older must show to enter any event with 50 or more people even one in their own home. They even need the pass to enter an outdoor event with more than 50 people. So now everyone knows who is and is not vaccinated, even children. They have a target to blame and those people are made real, public and visible every day. These same people do not know why a person might or might not be vaccinated. 
they do not know that some people won't vaccinate their children for the reasons I discussed above. They do not know that the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines were tested on fetal cell lines and the Oxford, AstraZeneca, and Janssen lines were made with fetal cell lines. Some people simply refuse to have any vaccine or medicine tested in such a way. They do not know if a person is simply waiting to be vaccinated because they are breastfeeding. These people have not seen a single study showing the vaccine won't harm their baby while they breastfeed and can pass on material from the vaccine to their babies. Instead, they are left to assume that an unvaccinated person is someone who would never vaccinate for any reason and whose motive is based solely on their own fears of vaccine without accounting for any potential social benefit of vaccination. They are left to assume the worst. They are left to do so in their ignorance, having had their own ability to cope with stress trashed by long-term lockdowns. In some cases, these same people have lost a job due to the lockdown. In some cases, these people have defaulted on mortgages. In some cases, these people have watched the slow destruction of their businesses. Businesses which were often lifelong dreams. That, my viewers, is a recipe for generating fear, anger, and hate if I have ever seen one. And it contains a serious positive feedback loop because as you impoverish and ostracize unvaccinated populations, they will also become angry with every shopkeeper and minimum wage front-facing staff member they encounter. Many will take to social media and write their own appalling comments. Many will protest violently with slogans that seem senseless to others. That is, they will simply follow Marion J. Levy's third law of the disillusionment of the true liberal. Last guys don't finish nice. So if this continues, both groups will find themselves able to easily believe they're fully justified in escalating the anger, fear, and hate. This recipe for a positive feedback loop has been seen over and over and over again in history. The recipe is so obvious that there is absolutely no excuse for any government to allow it to happen, either through malice or incompetence. And I believe the training in fear and hate people have received here can and may well result in much, much worse things than COVID. Whether such awful things happen to unvaccinated people or instead to whatever group we are told to hate next. So how can we untangle this mess? How do we stop this process now? First, recognize that opposing the current vaccine pass is not the same as opposing vaccination. These are two different issues. Now, let me address the unvaccinated people who have lost or are about to lose their jobs. The people who are being shut out of much of society. I know your circumstances are incredibly hard still. Please do not take out your frustrations on frontline staff at shops. These minimum wage workers can't change the laws. And all you're doing is generating anger and making your situation worse. If you feel the need to protest, do so and do so peacefully. That is your right and even your duty in a democratic system. But please don't do it in front of hospitals or schools. These are not the people responsible for the vaccine pass. Instead, hold your protests in front of the politicians and advisors who are responsible. Lastly, please make sure your protest is about economic and social exclusion and the indoctrination of children and not just mere inconvenience. Face masks and COVID testing most definitely suck but they are not themselves a form of oppression as long as these measures have a defined exit strategy. Neither is a government official knocking on your door to offer vaccination unless they come over and over again. Instead, I encourage you to protest the no jab, no job policy that offers no alternatives to vaccination. 
protest being excluded from society due to a system that offers no alternatives to vaccination. Protest the lack of a clear exit strategy for all of it. We must not live under perpetual fear and observation. If you focus your protests this way, you have the best chance of breaking the positive feedback loop of hate because you are showing everyone around you that you care about their well-being. Now for the rest, including the vaccinated people who were placed under indefinite quarantine, lost jobs, lost businesses, and lost houses. Do not let the government and media control who you fear. Even if you fear unvaccinated people based on your own reasoning, please do not let that fear lead you to sacrifice your own humanity. Do not allow yourself to give in to your fear and anger, lest you become tempted to hate, and in hating, choose to exclude, fire, and ruin people you don't understand. Are you an academic working at a university that is zealous for the current vaccine pass system? Do you disagree with this current system? Take heart. There are hundreds of academics and general staff and thousands of students who also disagree with the vaccine pass system as it exists today. Many are afraid to speak out for fear of losing their jobs or harming their reputation. But if more of us speak out, the rest will become encouraged to do so. Are you a healthcare professional who knows that your frequent testing has been quite effective at preventing the spread of COVID-19? Do you realize that doing things like shutting unvaccinated people out of jobs and exercise programs will likely do more to spread COVID instead of helping to contain it? Then speak up. You are not alone. I have certainly heard from many of your compatriots. Are you a social scientist or historian and you know exactly how cycles of hate and persecution develop? Then speak up. You are not alone and your voice will embolden others to speak up. And for the rest of you, I posted a link to a great series on how cycles of hate develop. I also posted a link to an historical case study in the former Soviet Union. If speaking up is still too scary for you and you are in New Zealand and you still want to see this country turn from the brink of destruction, you can still help. If you are an employer and can do so, consider hiring an otherwise competent unvaccinated person who recently lost a job. Consider signing the Don't Divide Us New Zealand petition, asking the law to change and allow testing as an alternative to vaccination. I have attached a link to the petition below. You can also consider a political party other than Labour in the next election. So far, almost all of them have called for more nuanced version of vaccine passes or no vaccine pass at all. Check each party's position closer to the next election and find out how likely they are to change the law. Do you know a conscientious objector who has no job and is facing financial difficulties? Make sure they are able to stay warm and be well-fed and help out when and where you can. For people in New Zealand and in countries with similar policies, this is the greatest moral test you have likely ever faced. Your decisions now will decide the fate of us all. Choose wisely. Stick around after the credits if you want to hear a special message for church-going Christians. For the rest of you, this has been Horizons of Thought. Right now in New Zealand, churches with more than 25 to 50 people per building, depending on the color of the traffic light, are required to scan vaccine passes. In response, almost the entirety of the church universal, regardless of denomination, has made one of two choices in New Zealand. Either they have shut the doors of their large buildings entirely, using them at most to broadcast services to private homes, or they have set up a dual system where there is a big service where vaccine passes are required and satellite small services 
that pipe in the sermon and choir, but have small groups of unvaccinated and vaccinated people worshiping together. Some churches plan on setting up outdoor pavilions or separating out their spaces into smaller groupings so that they may comply with government regulations while still allowing unified worship. All solutions that make sure that vaccinated and unvaccinated people can worship together, or solutions that move all of us to the same conditions as unvaccinated people are acceptable and godly. If, however, you are attending a church that is forcing everyone to be vaccinated to worship together, you need to take action. I already know people in other parts of the world where vaccine-based exclusion in church has happened and their churches participation in such things has broken their hearts. In such a case, pray for your church and follow the rules Jesus laid out in Matthew 18, 15 to 18. Talk to the pastor, priest, or vicar about a form of open church. If they don't listen, talk to the elders or bishops or patriarchs. If they don't listen, address the whole congregation. If they all fail to listen and decide to stick to their division of people, walk away, shake the dust off your feet as per Matthew 10, 14, and move on to another congregation and or denomination. A church that lets its government dictate whom they may or may not worship with is no longer a church of God. But we have a God who answers prayer and we can pray this policy ends soon. The vaccine pass will not likely last long. We can pray that people oppose this policy. Even now, this prayer is being answered. We can act to make sure that unvaccinated people and their families are not suffering from food or shelter insecurity. And in contrast to that stark and dark message, let me end with a message of light. In my church, there is a family who lost two of their grandparents to COVID recently. On Sunday, I walked in to the open church service and saw all of them walk up to the front row of our small service and worship with us. Masks on, but there with us. I cried with joy during the entire Christmas carol service because I knew I was standing in the presence of people who themselves take COVID precautions seriously, but who will not let fear overcome love. They know that there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. The one who fears is not made in perfect love. 1 John 4:18. These are true brothers and sisters who model our faith with their very lives.